Good evening as we stand, let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have spoken to us in the Scriptures. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is amongst us this evening and at work within us. And we pray that you will help us now to hear your voice and to believe it and to learn to obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. Do take a seat. The loving kindness of God, that's what we're thinking about this evening from that passage in the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus. And if you haven't uh, got that open in front of you, do open that up. Uh, Titus 3, verses 3 to 8, page 998, and uh, across to the next page, page 998 in the Bibles that are around uh, the pews. And as Ian said, these verses talk about the way that a new Christian's life is transformed. It uh, has been so encouraging, hasn't it, to see Robert and Chung Ting uh, being baptized this evening and to hear their testimonies. In uh, my own experience, this transformation began when I was just in my early teens. God used uh, school Christian Union group that I started going along to, and also uh, a series of talks, rather like the talks that have been going on at the Newcastle University CU Events Week this last week. And in one sense, nothing very dramatic happened. I think anyone watching me looking on would not really have seen immediately any difference. But looking back, my life was utterly changed. What is it that causes this transformation? It is God's gift of his Holy Spirit. It is a free gift, no purchase required like, like you have to do for a free coffee from Waitrose. But what exactly is the nature of the transformation that the Holy Spirit makes in the Christian's life? Well, these verses in Titus 3 give a beautiful summary of it. And I want to look at what they have to say under three headings. So first of all, they're very simple headings. First of all, life without the Holy Spirit is bad. Secondly, the Holy Spirit makes us new. And thirdly, life with the Holy Spirit is good. Before we get into that, though, just a little bit of background. So this is a letter from the Apostle Paul to Titus. Who is he? He was a Christian who had been converted to Christ uh, through Paul's own teaching. So Paul calls him at the beginning of the letter in chapter 1, verse 4, my true child in a common faith. And Titus used to travel with Paul on his church planting team. Uh, they must have worked together in Crete because Titus has been left there by Paul to get the communities of new Christian converts established and on their feet. So Paul writes to Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. Now, these young uh, Christians, these gatherings of young Christians, were facing two main issues. For one thing, they were already, there were already amongst them people who were, who were leading them away from Jesus with lies. So chapter 1, verse uh, 10, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. And for another thing, these young Christians were used to a lifestyle that was no good for those who now belong to Christ. So Paul says in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Though nothing if not blunt, so Paul is telling his co-worker Titus to keep reminding them of the gospel 
and how to live in the light of it. So that's the background. And the truth is that we all need exactly those same reminders of the gospel, which is what makes this passage so valuable, so exciting for us. So if you like to think of yourself as an ex-liar, evil beast, and lazy glutton, then this is right on the button for you. So we can see three things about life in these verses. First of all, life without the Holy Spirit is bad. Now, maybe your reaction to that is, well, it's not as bad as all that. If so, you are up against God's perspective that comes to us through his apostle, Paul. You're up against God's perspective on what life is like without him. So look at what God says through Paul here in verse uh, 3 of chapter 3. For we ourselves were once... Foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So Paul is saying, I was like this. And you were like this too. So there's absolutely no sense of any kind of moral or spiritual superiority in this analysis. He makes crystal clear in verse 5 that the transformation of the Christian's life was, as he puts it, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his, that's God's own mercy. In other words, unless God had acted we would still be like this. If things have changed, it is no thanks to us. It is thanks to God alone. How does this godless life seem to those who are living it? Seems to me it would appear to those in the thick of it to be a life of independence and a life lived in pursuit of very appealing passions and pleasures. It's a life of independence in the sense that we say to ourselves, I don't need anyone telling me what to do. Thank you very much. It's my life. I can do with it whatever I want. And the word that Paul uses for that kind of attitude is disobedience. We do need God telling us what to do. He knows what's best for us. He knows what's good for us. He made us. And our life does not belong to us. It belongs to God who did make us and who gave his son for us. And as for our passions and pleasures, the things we want above all else, the things our minds dwell on that consume our energies, we think we chose them and we have them under control. But no, says Paul. They enslave us they control us not the other way around this is the life says Paul that is shot through with hatred as he puts it in verse 3 we pass our days in malice and envy hated by others and hating one another it's a life without contentment because our pursuits of our pursuit of passions and pleasures never satisfies us It's a life without freedom because we are enslaved. It's a life without direction because we reject God's guidance. It's a life without wisdom. We are foolish. In short, it's a bad life. And what is more, we can't see it because we are deceived. Satan blinds and deceives us. I heard an ex-soldier talking about his wartime experience, and he described how in the thick of battle, he suddenly fell, and he found he couldn't move. And he thought he'd been hit, but he couldn't feel anything. He struggled to move, and after, after a while, as he looked down to where his feet should have been, he realized that half of one of his legs 
had been shot right away. And it didn't hurt at all. He was desperately wounded. He was all but bleeding to death. But at first he didn't even realize it. And even when he did, unable to move with the battle raging but no one near, he could not do anything at all to help himself. And life without the Holy Spirit, according to God, in his word, in the scriptures, is a bit like that. Our situation is critical, but we don't feel it. We don't see it. We think we're relatively okay. But we're not. We're dying. Life without the Holy Spirit is bad. It's often only after we've been given the Holy Spirit that we realize just how bad we are. I always remember something my mum said to me soon after my faith in Jesus came alive. So I was just in my kind of mid-teens at the time. And she had asked me uh, to help with something around the house. And in my usual way, I was making some excuse about why I couldn't because uh, what I wanted to do was so much more important than helping her. And my mum was usually incredibly tolerant with her uh, children and with me. But I don't know why, but on this occasion, something snapped inside her. And very uncharacteristically, she blurted out at me, Jonathan, you are so selfish. And it was like a dagger to my heart because I instantly knew that she was right. And as you can see, I haven't forgotten that moment uh, even to this day, all these decades later. God used my mum to lay bare before me the real me. And it was not a pretty sight. It was bad. Life without the Holy Spirit is bad. Secondly, the Holy Spirit makes us new. So Paul has delivered his damning indictment of rebellious, godless human nature, his own included, and yours included, and mine included. And then comes one of these glorious biblical buts. Because the astounding good news is that God saves us. He rescues us from this bad, hell-bound life. From verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So this is what those ex-liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons needed to be reminded of again and again, and so do we. And Paul answers four questions in that little section. Why does God save us? How does God save us? What happens to us when God saves us? And when does God save us? So first of all, why does God save us? Because of his love and mercy, that's why. His love will not let us go. His mercy will not give us what we deserve. And it is not because of anything in us. Maybe you yourself know that you're not yet a Christian. But you also have come to the realization that you now believe that Jesus is the Son of God, crucified and risen from the dead. And you know you need to get straight with him. And maybe you're saying to yourself, surely there's some, some good in my past life that's to my credit that I can draw to his attention as evidence that at least I've tried. Surely he'll take that into account. And if that is you, if that's the way you're inclined to think, then Paul says, don't even think about it. 
Verse 3 is the truth about your past life. You have lived for yourself, not for Jesus. We've all done it. We're all in the same boat. Why does God save us? It's because of his love and his mercy from beginning to end. Secondly, how does God save us? Well, it happens in two phases. Phase one, God the Father sends the Son who died and rose again for us, breaking the power of evil once for all, paying the full penalty for our sin. So the apostle talks about Jesus Christ, our Savior. Phase two, the Son sends the Holy Spirit who was poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, as Paul says. So the cross and resurrection is the once for all objective saving act. And it is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus himself, who enters our hearts and applies to our lives all that Jesus has done for us. So how does God save us? One, his Son. Two, his Spirit. Thirdly, what happens to us when God saves us? Well, it's there in verse 5. The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We experience a regeneration, a rebirth, it's what we've seen symbolized in baptism, but which is the work of the Spirit within us. We are born again. We are made new. Regeneration and renewal are really two words for the same thing. And it's the giving and sustaining of that new life, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in every Christian. Fourthly, when does God save us? Well, one good answer to that would simply be when he chooses to. But I want to draw your attention to another answer, which is actually embedded here in verse 8. So in verse 8, Paul is concerned that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. So when does God save us? When we believe in God, when we put our trust in him. You cannot have the Holy Spirit without believing in God. And you cannot believe in God. You cannot trust God without the Holy Spirit in your life. Trusting God is the bread and butter of a life made new by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. For me, as I was saying before, I was just in my early teens when the Holy Spirit took hold of me. Outwardly, it was und uh, undramatic. But inwardly, my entire focus shifted from myself to Jesus, crucified and risen. And a fire of love for Christ and for his word, the Bible, began to burn inside me, in my young heart, and it has never gone out. So life without the Holy Spirit is bad. The Holy Spirit makes us new. And finally, and thirdly, life with the Holy Spirit is good. It is a good life. Life with the Holy Spirit is good because for the past, we have forgiveness. Verse 7 says, we are justified by his grace. Life with the Holy Spirit is, is good because in the future we have eternal life. Verse 7 again, we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I heard those two things well put in a kind of gospel riddle which goes like this. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Hell is averted and heaven opened to us when the Spirit gives us new life and nothing could be better than that. 
But life with the Holy Spirit is also good because of the experiences that he gives us in the present. Paul talks about some of them here. We know ourselves to be children in the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are heirs of all God's riches in Christ, and we have the life-changing hope of that royal, eternal inheritance, lives filled with hope. We get wisdom in place of folly, direction in place of disobedience, truth instead of deception, freedom in place of slavery, contentment rather than envy, and love in place of hatred. Now the challenge to us is not to leave those gifts unwrapped and neglected and unused, but every believer through the gift of the Holy Spirit has all of that. It's an amazing thing to have God's Spirit within you. Paul tells Titus to remind the Cretan believers that life with the Holy Spirit is good. How does he want the Cretans to respond? In a nutshell, this is what he says. With the Holy Spirit, life is good, so be good and do good. So back in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, Remind them to be ready for every good work. For me, the whole direction of my life was changed. I had been headed towards a life as a civil engineer in the family business, but instead uh, the Lord turned me right around and took me down a path that brought me here. Uh, as for being good, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I am still working on that one. I have a long way to go. Each one of us is very different. But I wonder what is the plan for doing good that God has for your life. Verse 8, I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in good may be careful to devote themselves to good works. So what have we learned? Life without God is bad, but God is good and gracious. By his Holy Spirit, he makes us new. So be good and do good. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge, maybe for the first time, maybe afresh, yet again, that without you we are lost, we are slaves to sin. But we praise you that you came to us in the person of your Son, our beloved Savior, and we praise you that as we put our trust in him, your Spirit comes and lives within us. Heavenly Father, teach us to trust Jesus and so change us that we will devote the rest of our lives to doing good for the sake of a lost world and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.